Welcome to the Solar Decathlon Building Science Education Series. I'm Paul Torsellini, and in this episode, we're going to share a webinar from the 2019 Design Challenge presented by Amber Wood. Amber was a student intern at NREL and worked for Nresco, the developer of the computer program Remrate that is discussed in this episode. She now works for the city of Denver, Colorado, working for the Office of Climate Action. We hope you enjoy, and please let us know if you have any questions. Hello, and welcome to the REM rate training for the Solar Decathlon. My name is Amber Wood, and I'm with Naresco and the REM rate team. So here's a little agenda of the webinar that I have planned, uh, a little bit of an introduction, uh, answering the question why you need to use an energy model, and then going specifically into REM rate and, and the demo, followed by some advanced analysis that you can do within REM beyond just kind of the demo, and then some resources and technical support. So there's a little introduction to Noresco. Uh, Noresco is a, an energy services company. REM rate's been a long time product, and we have active involvement with ResNet, who's the trade association for the Home Energy Rating System, or HERS. Uh, my name's Amber Wood, I'm the REM team manager. My background is in building science and energy modeling. So we actually have two REM products. One is REM design and it's really used for analysis, energy loads, consumption, costs, as well as code compliance and the DOE weatherization program. REM rate is a little more broad. It includes all of the REM design features and then it also enables you to do a home energy rating certificate, energy star, DOE zero energy ready home, and, and custom code reports as well. So one of the questions and where I'd like to start is really bother, bother with modeling. Um, and really the, the key of that is just that houses are systems. So trying to do analysis that's just one off is much more interactive and it's, it's helpful to get a full context through using energy modeling. Energy modeling is really good for a what-if scenarios. So the modeling kind of gets progressively more accurate as you go down this list. There's predictive analysis where it's, it's a pretty general analysis. You're putting a house or a building in energy modeling software, and then you're, really, you're generally predicting end uses from that. Comparative analysis is really kind of the sweet spot for energy modeling because basically you're comparing either a home, uh, home improvements what they might have been before, or you're comparing a design to a reference. And then the final version that you can do would be did modeling, where you actually use utility bills and then calibrate the model so that then you have a more scaled model and more accurate. It's, it's much more accurate. But it takes a lot more work, and it is modeling generally is inherently expensive. So one of the keys and challenges is to energy modeling is to decide how accurate is good enough and how much data you actually need in order to get kind of the general level of results that you're trying to achieve. So um, when you're ready to install Remrate, you just go to remrate.com and you download the latest version. I'm just showing here, you just click on the download Rem Remrate version 1571, which is our current version. You can also download earlier versions, but my recommendation is to stick with the latest version. And when you start entering a building, there's a couple different methodologies you can use. One is called simplified and the other is detailed. Um, I'm going to go into how to use the libraries within, in REM rate where you can store repetitive data. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and actually do a live tour here instead. So I'm going to move this out of the way and this is REM, this is version 1571, which you can see in the very top left here. It shows the version. And then beside that, it shows the building name. And this is actually one of the buildings that comes default with REM so that you can kind of look through that. So there's a couple file um, ways to get through files. The, the top icon menu really will show kind of the general new file open, those kinds of things. After that, you'll find the notes and then the spreadsheet, which you can turn off there these little extras on the side here. So if I, if I close the notes and the spreadsheet, you can easily access them and open them here. The next is actually just runs a quick analysis. So this 
pane right here is the quick analysis pane. I'm going to close the notes and spreadsheet just so it's not uh, in the way right now. But so if you click the lightning bolt, you'll actually see that you get some results over here. Um, anything that's a change in result will show up as a red number. So if I hit the lightning bolt again, everything's going to go to black because I actually just and there's no change with the previous uh, run that I did. There's also a bunch of other information. So this is the first tab, which is energy. It, you can get information on the area of the building that you have put into REM. Uh, and it gives you like window to wall ratio if you need these pieces and window specifications. The next tab goes into the codes and whether they pass or fail. You'll see right now they're all failing, but we'll get to why that is in a little bit. And then the final one is air, really uh, reporting on whole house infiltration and ventilation. So that's a helpful tab as well. I'll stick with the energy because I think that's probably the easiest to look at for now. Um, there's a couple ways to navigate through the tool. One are these little fingers back and forth that are showing you this direction. So I can go forward in screens and back in screens. Um, another way to do it are the little arrows at the very top you can do the exact same thing. And finally, um, something I'm gonna be probably showing a bit as we go through this is the question mark, which actually just brings up the REM help. The nice part is that usually it will bring up the help for the, the page that you're on. So if you just kind of want, want quick uh, information, so I'm actually on the uh, site information screen, you can see here, and it brought up the site information help. But if you need content, con, uh, contents, or if you want to see the index, or if you want to search any of those, um, you can definitely do that. You can also create favorites um, if that's helpful to, to use for the help menu. So there's then text menus as well. So you kind of have the file, which is just your general. Uh, the building is actually super helpful because it basically will allow you to jump screens. So I'm on the site information screen right now. If I want to jump to infiltration and ventilation, this is primarily how I use um, the navigation just because I find it much, much faster for myself. Um, you can kind of go through the rest of these. There's another way then in case you hide the icons, you can open notes and spreadsheets here as well. We're going to get into the libraries in detail in a bit. Uh, reports, which actually the easiest way to get to reports is actually the one right next to the lightning bolt that says select reports. If you hit that, it just brings up the screen. And then we have some extra tools and, and the help, which you can also get through the text menu. So that's pretty much how you just basically navigate. There's a couple tricks. So um, I don't know if you can see this really well, but my cursor disappears when I'm right next to the line of the analysis, which allows me to drag all of these, it, it may not be totally intuitive, but you can resize all of them, which is nice. You can, if you grab the top, you can undock it, and then you can always redock it. So just some, you know, pretty, pretty standard type user things, but it can be really helpful if you can't read some of the names or you need more information on the errors and warnings, you can definitely drag those around. So we're gonna get a little bit into uh, screen by screen here, because I think that's helpful as entering a building and um, you can always cruise, cruise through it if you uh, have already done this. But the, the first screen is really just a very general screen about property and builder information. The organization is usually the, the raider, so if this is a HERS raider or if it's your um, school organization, you can definitely put that information in here. This is really generally for a HERS raider. Um, you're more than welcome to use it. I, it doesn't quite apply. But the one piece on the rating type here that does is that it does help you to go ahead and specify whether it's um, based on plans or not. I mean, I would generally guess that this might be based on plans, but you might actually end up with a rating that, um, that would be a different rating type. And if you want information on the rating types, of course, hit the help button and it will go through what all of those mean in detail. Moving on, this is really where you start getting more specific. So you'd select a climate. So the ellipse buttons here, um, they actually will bring up all these menus. So you basically then here are going to select your weather data. You can select it by zip code or you can select it by 
and then city and that's pretty straightforward and we'll give you some additional information over on the right of, about the uh, specifics of that climate. You then need to enter utility data. So here we have some default. We have a default of each one. And this is pretty straightforward. If you want a new one, you just hit new and then you can enter whatever you need to. Um, there's a service charge area and a rate area. You can do seasons as well. Depends on how intricate you want to get with utility rates, but you can definitely do most everything you need. Um, you can always delete something um, and then just standard cut, cut copy paste types, types of things are available in all of these. So here's where you kind of general building information. So the floor plan for this is 3,000 square feet. And something to note though is it is two floors. So um, you also need to put in the number of bedrooms because that will actually calculate some of the ventilation requirements and other requirements within the software. And then you specify the foundation type. There's a number of foundation types and something that I should have noted, noted first was that there are also a bunch of housing types. So right now we have single family detached selected, but you can do townhomes and apartments and duplexes as well. So that will actually help depending on what type of energy model you're trying to achieve. So foundation walls, again, similar. You have you know, new, delete, copy. Now the interesting piece is that we're going to start to get into some of the libraries here. So you can see under type that we right now have that you have a foundation wall that has R19 that's a full drape, meaning it's all the way from the floor to the ceiling, it's draped with R19. If you hit the more button, basically you'll open the foundation wall type library and there's all sorts of preset library entries that you can select. You can also create your own custom one, whether you copy it or, or um, start from scratch, you can do any of those pieces. And then you just have to enter the rest of the specifications. The location is particularly important and if you put a bogus location, so for example, this is showing that I have a crawl space because that's what um, I selected in the, let me go back into the general building information. This is an enclosed crawl space foundation type. So in the foundation screen, I have the location selected between enclosed crawl space and ambient ground. The thing you have to be careful of here is that you don't select something that you don't have. So if I would select that it was between an unconditioned basement and a garage year, and, I, and then I hit the quick analysis, it'll give me an error because I have um, misaligned the location with the foundation. So there's a lot of helpful errors. Keep in mind that you can't run the numbers if you get an error. You can run them if you get warnings. So um, something to just keep in mind. So I'm gonna go back to the selection I had before. We don't have slab floors, and if you don't have one, you don't need to put it in. You just leave that blank and move on. Uh, floors, similarly, um, the button, the, the three dots will get you the library and you can enter something else or select something else. The one thing worth noting is that the libraries piece will actually bring up the same dialog box. So we're in the floors. If I go to floor, this is the exact same library entry. So that's helpful to know. There's a couple different ways to get at things. So just trying to let you know what those all might be. Uh, rim and band joist properties. Uh, again, you just enter the, the, the values. One of the things that I like to do here is that there is a really nice picture of what a rim and band joist area is. So if you're not familiar with residential construction and you're, and you're trying to apply this to residential construction, this is generally what we mean by the rim band joist area. You'd have a subfloor over that and then start with the above grade walls once you get um, past that. So. All right, so we are to the above grade walls. So I'm going to bring up the library like I've done before. The one thing to note for the walls in particular is that they, right now we have selected quick fill site belt. So uh, again, you can go through the libraries and you can select whichever one you want. but if you really need to do detailed wall analysis, I suggest choosing path layer. And what that'll end up doing is basically then you can put in each path layer, each parallel path that you have, and then you can basically create your wall in a parallel path form. Um, so this lists each of the, uh, from the inside to the outside, and then you have to put in the R values 
And so um, there is, again, a lot of information in the help, but that's one way to enhance or get a pretty detailed analysis of a wall if you need that. Windows and glass, uh, pretty straightforward. You just put in each different individual window. So the interesting part about REM is a seasonal analysis and it allows you to do a couple things. One of them is you don't have to specify an orientation for your walls. So the, the walls were just input in this particular example file as just a single wall. Um, each window will need to be actually assigned to a wall. So at the very bottom here under wall assignment, you'll see that it is uh, assigned to the one above grade wall, which is fine in the sense that it, it's not gonna make a difference for the calculations behind REM rate, but I would, it's gonna be harder to have somebody else look at or do quality control or quality assurance on your file um, if you just have one wall instead of basically tracking them by orientation. So my suggestion would actually be uh, looking at the windows, we have windows on each side. So if I would go back to the above grade wall, my recommendation would actually be instead of entering it as one wall, to enter a wall for each cardinal direction. So I could just copy these and I could basically then, um, depending on how much wall area I had, I would then uh, specify those. But just something to think about as you're entering them, it is easier to kind of look through and, and uh, troubleshoot, particularly if you have issues later. So we're gonna delete, um, we're gonna delete these extra walls here, but something to keep in mind. Uh, you can also put overhangs in the window area, and then there's shading um, specifications available as well. You can, of course, get to the window library and change the window U value and solar heat gain coefficients through this screen. The doors are pretty straightforward, similar to the windows. They have to be assigned to a wall, um, and similar to everything else, there is a library. Ceilings are the same, except there is an attic exterior square footage, which actually doesn't really make a, an, isn't an issue unless you have a vaulted ceiling or a sealed attic. A lot more information and help uh, in the help menu on that. So let's go ahead and just kind of look. So you can see all the ceiling property information and you do, the one difference with the ceiling is that you do in the library have to specify the ceiling type there. So right now we have an attic, which would be pretty standard for a single family home, but you may end up with a different, um, with a different ceiling type that you would need to specify here. All right. We don't have skylights, but those are similar to windows as far as entry goes. Um, and now we're to mechanical equipment. So the thing that you can tell from the mechanical equipment, this combines heating, cooling, and water heating into one screen. So the first one you can see under library type is a space heating um, piece of equipment. And then under equipment and the dot, 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 um, you can look at the heating type library. There's a number of, of heating type equipment already in, um, in the library. And you just have to carefully kind of look through and make sure you're aware of the, um, both the system type can specify. There's a number of different system types in here, as well as the fuel type. Um, so it is easy to copy and paste if you want to do that and then create a new one if you have a different size capacity or something like that. That's a, an easy way to do that. So something to keep in mind. Um, the next piece is you can see space cooling equipment. It's a 14 steer three ton air conditioning unit. And also note that you do have to select the location of that piece of equipment. Finally, we get to the water heater, similar to the others. There's a number already included and you can put the location. Um, now there is a performance adjustment percentage. My recommendation for that is that you would only use that had very old equipment and you were really trying to um, show some degradation of performance based on the age of the equipment. I think in most cases, you're probably not gonna need to use this. The one thing that you might wanna notice is that there is a percent load served item over here. So right now I'm, I have the hot water heater selected, so it's showing 100% of hot water heating. Um, 
if I go to the air conditioner, for example, it does show that, that the air conditioner is providing 100% of the load. The only reason, or one of the reasons where this becomes important is if I would copy this because let's say there was an air conditioner on each floor of the house, since this is a two floor house, and added a second one, you can see what happened. Each one now, we have two cooling systems, each one is now 50% um, load. And the other piece that you can do is if you're right now, we have the checkbox that, that is saying that for cooling, the capacity, um, it's weighted on the capacity percent of the load served. So we have two three ton AC units, therefore it's 50-50. If I uncheck this, I can actually change that because maybe your control configuration is different or you need to model it in a different way. So that's one thing you can do. Um, and also keep in mind that it will automatically change if I go ahead and go into the library and instead of a three ton unit, we make this, um, let's make it a two ton unit. So it's 24 kBTUs, we'll take this, make it two tons and hit okay. Um, it was just telling me it wasn't in the library, so I was saving it in the library there. Um, now you have 40% cooling for the two ton and 60% for the three. So and again, you can uncheck and you can change these values um, manually if you need to. I'm going to delete it, so we got to go back to where we were, but I just wanted you to be aware of some of those tricks. So the domestic hot water efficiencies, this is really hot water heating distribution. So this is really plumbing. Um, ResNet has a bunch of, so Anything that says ResNet is usually uh, anti-ResNet 301 standard that ResNet developed as an anti-process. And so there's a way to basically determine the de default of the total pipe length. And if you hit that button, that's what you get. The other pieces that you can take credit for is um, low flow faucets and showers. You can also take advantage of checking if the, all, all domestic hot water pipes are fully insulated. This is also where if you have a research system, you would go ahead, there's a drop down here, and it, you have to specify how it's being controlled. And, it, and if you have, I should say, or if you have drain water heat recovery, this is where you would put that in as well. We move to ducts. So right now we just have one duct system. Similar, you can copy, delete any of those. Um, you can put in what the duct surface area is, or you can estimate it if you hit the estimate surface button. In the location tab, you just need to put in what heating and cooling equipment your duct system is for. If you don't have any ducts, you just, you just go ahead and go none. So maybe you only have a heating, heating, a ducted heating system, then you would put none in cooling. Um, and then location of the ducts and you can use multiple duct locations if you need that. Um, that's where you would enter that. As far as the duct leakage, that's this next tab. And your input type, you would specify whether it's um, measured. In, the, in your case, I don't think you're probably going to be using threshold, but you can if you need to. Um, you can change the units of measure, and then you would put in your total duct leakage uh, per standard 152. There are some test exemptions. This is generally used for either code compliance or rating um, the home, giving it a HERS index and or an ERI, that there are some test exemptions for when you have all of your ducts and conditions space. You may or may not be required per code to, to actually do a duct, uh, a duct leakage test. Um, that's what this box is for. For predictive modeling, I would not use any of these checkboxes. We're getting to a pretty big key here, which is uh, infiltration and ventilation. So infiltration is the leakage to outside that you would do with a blower door test, and then you would put in your annual value um, and, and detail that. There's a bunch of different ways you can input that depending on the units that you're using or measured. Mechanical ventilation is also quite important. You can select what type of mechanical ventilation you have, and then there will be different specifications based on whether it's a balance system. 
or not. If it's exhaust only, you won't be able to, to put in he any heat recovery or recovery efficiency. Um, and then you put in your, your hours and your watts and you call it a day. Um, most often, natural ventilation is selected for cooling, for the use of operable windows. Um, a lot more information on the help about that if you, if you want to look into it in more detail. We're to appliances now. And the easiest way to do this, if you don't have specifications, is to hit uh, restore ResNet defaults. And basically, that'll put in what ResNet has specified as the default for a refrigerator and all of the appliances within the home. The one thing that you will need to do is specify your range oven fuel, and your, you will need to make sure that your, um, you have a location for your water dryer and that your dryer fuel is specified. Lighting is specified per ANSI ResNet 301, and again, you can get a lot of information here in the help. I'm going to scroll to the lighting. Um, and the thing you just have to note is that what you're going to have to figure out are the qualifying light fixtures. So this is basically of your lighting, of your lighting fixtures, what percentage would be uh, fluorescent or CFL um, or LED. And so then you apply those and you can take advantage, you can take credit essentially for efficient lighting fixtures in the analysis there. You can also do an actual audit um, if you know exactly the, all of the appliances that are going to be installed, you can do more of an audit. The only challenge with that is that the audit will not be used for um, calculations like a HERS index or an ERI because of the way the standards are specified, they would actually go ahead and use the rating tab. So the audit isn't used in all of the analysis, just so you're aware of that. So I would recommend just sticking with the rating and that's probably gonna be appropriate. So for the moment, I'm actually gonna skip mandatory requirements and come back to that because we have just a few more inputs that are a little more unusual. And this is really where you get into interior mass. So this is passive solar trying to model that, you could model a, a number of different types, whether it's, um, so this is basically storage, in, interior mass storage, and it's uh, exposed. So if you had an exposed concrete floor and you were actually taking advantage of some thermal mass cap, uh, capabilities of that, that's, this is where you would enter it. For the most part, all you're going to have for most um, buildings is just the drywall, but you are you can model that in here. We have active solar, which is basically solar thermal and some direct heating, um, space heating. So those are specified in this screen. You can do um, you do have to do the orientation and the collector type. Make sure you get that uh, drop down selected correctly. PV goes in a separate screen. Now, there's kind of a couple different ways to do PV. So one is to basically just use REM, REM's estimate. But over the past few years, uh, PV Watts, the PV Watts tool has really taken off and really has very good PV um, capability of predicting PV production. So my, so you can either use REM, which is, which is an older, um, more archaic, uh, frankly, uh, way of calculating the PV. I would actually recommend, and a lot of raters that I talk to basically use PV watts and then put a system back in uh, that matches then the annual consumption for the PV um, that they got from PV watts. So it is totally up to you how you want to do that and whether you want to do the workaround. You can do it either way, but uh, I think it's a little more accurate, frankly, to use PV watts at this point. That's my two cents. Sun spaces are the next few screens, and really a sun space is going to be an isolated, it can be isolated, and it doesn't have any HVAC system. So it's basically being used as um, heating and, and or cooling, depending on the time of year, and then connecting it to the house or disconnecting it from the house based on the time of day. So this isn't basically like just a little room that is still heated or cooled. You just include that in... Um, that, like a porch that's been enclosed and is actually actively heated and cooled, that wouldn't apply in this case. So there are a number of sun space um, screens because you have to specify the roof and the walls and then all of the insulation and windows that are in that space. So that's all of the end screens. So if I 
go here and we can look at the building, you can see that Sun Space here has a number of different entries. Okay. So that is really kind of the all of the from hopefully not too tedious. Uh, and I'd like to get a little bit more now into some of the errors and warnings. So um, I'm going to reopen the example file that I started with so that I don't end up with additional errors that I didn't intend. Um, so I'm just going to show you, I had shown you before that, you know, if you get an error, you aren't actually able to run the numbers. But what happens with the warnings, you, you can still run it, but that might not be correct. So let's just look at this first warning. And it's, it says that the frame floor area and the slab floor area is greater than the ceiling area. If I go to the floor, this is basically how you just actively troubleshoot something. So if I go to the frame floor, it's 1,500 square feet. And if I go to the ceiling, and I skip the slab because we don't have one, if I go to the ceiling, it says it's 1,100 square feet. So that's the reason you're getting the error. So the way that you would fix that is 1,500 is the correct area for that. And if I rerun it, you'll see that the, um, the warning went away. So you can also look at, uh, the, you can kind of go through each warning and determine whether you want to address it or not. So one of the, this one, next one is basically that the wall appears to be small in relation to the conditioned floor area, which if you go through and calculate it, um, it really is actually input incorrectly as well. So you would fix that if, and then for the HERS runtime alert. So this is basically saying that the home doesn't meet, the ventilation doesn't meet ASHRAE 62 to 2013. So let's look at the ventilation here. So if I look at the ventilation screen and the air tab, it basically says that my as-is home right now has 75 CFM of ventilation, which meets ASHRAE 622210, but 622213 is more stringent. So I can actually just leave this warning right now, assuming that I'm not trying to comply with 2013. If I'm trying to comply with 2013, I obviously need to update it if my jurisdiction or the program I meet allows 2010 you can just leave it as is so just some things to think about okay i did want to loop back to the codes because now i can run it looks like everything just fails and it's like well what's going on so usually what's happening in this case is that you need to go to the mandatory requirement screen so the way that rem works is basically that there there are a number of additional mandatory requirements beyond those that are going to be actually able to be modeled within the software that are required if you're doing code compliance and or even if you're just doing energy star partially because those require visual inspection so what has really happened i'm going to say that i have checked everything and i'm aware of code compliance and that it's all working and you can see that that changed all of these to pass so Often, if you're trying to do just a predictive analysis, I would go ahead and, and make sure that these are checked so that you can really look at code if that's something you're trying to do. Um, and then when it doesn't pass, you can basically then open some of the reports and troubleshoot that. So with Energy Star, and none of the Energy Stars at the top passes, right? So I'm going to go to Energy Star version 3.1. I do have to say that it complies here, similar to the mandatory requirements. Um, and then what I'm going to do is say that I have one refrigerator and one dishwasher that are Energy Star, and then I'm going to run it again. And it still fails. So what I need to do is go into the report, and let's look at why it's failing. So if I select all three of the Energy Star version 1 reports, I don't need the label. That, that won't really show me anything extra. I'll add those, and we'll hit OK and run the report. And I'll make this a little bigger. So this report tells me that one or more envelope components don't meet grade one. So what I know from this is that if I go back into my insul anything that would have insulation, so we're just going to take, for example, the floors, which are insulated. The cavity insulation grade here is, is three. And so I'm going to make that one. And 
if I did that for each of the insulation features, it would pass Energy Star because I've played with this before. Um, now, one of your questions might be, what does insulation um, installation mean? So let's look that up in the help. So insula uh, insulation installation, there we go. I did it backwards, but it'll still come up. Um, let's see what we have, Cav cavity insulation grade. So this then will bring up exactly what it means to be grade one. And it's basically used to describe insulation that is installed with the manufacturer's inspection, uh, according to manufacturer's instructions. So this does require, as far as if, if a home's being certified somehow, it would require a visual inspection. So for Energy Star, for example, has visual checklists that they would have to go through and verify that they were at the house before the drywall was installed. And then they would basically put, um, be able to put the specific grading on. So just something to keep in mind. So that would be essentially the way that you would, you would real time uh, go ahead and, and troubleshoot. So you can do that with all of these and that's, that's generally how that works. Um, very good. So we're gonna move on to looking a little bit more um, at the results. So I did it pretty quickly before and I wanna just make sure that you know. So next to the lightning bolt, the, the little report looking thing, select reports will get you to the report as will the same new view select reports within the, the uh, drop down menu. So this is the report selection tool. You can see we have a number of reports within Remrate. Um, a lot of them are code compliance. So one of the ways that you can do, that you can um, think about this is that there are groups of reports. So if you want just kind of energy analysis, code compliance, you can definitely select through those. Um, for now, let's just look at energy analysis. And you can remove all and then add all and it, it'll just pretty easily select the reports. And this is what then it'll bring up. So it'll bring up a merged report and you can just scroll through all of the different reports. The component loads, I'm gonna just pause on because this is actually one really good way to troubleshoot the building if, and, and troubleshoot your model. Because if you for some reason see that the skylights, the windows and skylights are really, really have a high component load, um, you may just wanna check that those are correctly input into the software. And they might be, but it's worth a check. The other thing I want you to be a little bit aware of is that the biggest impact on the model is really in infiltration and ventilation. So if you change these significantly, um, you can really end up having a large change on your model. And one of the things it's, that's worth consider considering is that the cold dwelling inf infiltration is, is a test that happens kind of after the structure is mostly com constructed and it's really hard to change. So if you're really trying to hit energy efficiency numbers, um, it's, it's really important to ensure that you're carefully putting in the whole dwelling infiltration numbers. And Building America has a lot of research on different infiltration. Um, the the uh, Solution Center probably has a lot of information on infiltration as well, but just something you really do wanna carefully put into the model because it does have a large effect. The mechanical ventilation also has a pretty big effect, so both of those are, are things you should keep in mind. Okay, so we are gonna move on to, I wanted to let you know a little bit more detail about if you're interested in looking at ERI, one of which is the ResNet HER score, um, you, you do need to be a little mindful that in that analysis that there's set points that are always set to a specific number and that's part of what's specified by the standard I had mentioned before. Uh, ANSI ResNet 301 is a standard that specifies all of these different pieces. So the impact and the reason I'm bringing this up is because what ends up happening is that if I go look at the set points in the mechanical equipment screen. You can see that the set point for heating is 68 and for cooling at 78. And that's standard because that is what the, the standard includes. But if you change those to more kind of typical operational numbers, which often are like 70 and 72, for example, what ends up happening is you can run this um, 
and it'll give you results. You can see the HERS index, you can, you can look at the energy. But what will end up happening is that you may end up with actually different results than what you're seeing in your HERS analysis. Because this is gonna be the analysis that's shown in the quick analysis is basically the, the building as its input. And then on top of that for an analysis like a HERS rating or energy, you end up with a design home and a reference home. And it will automatically do things like change the set points to specified set points for that program and do a comparison. So if you're trying to do a comparison of your design home, your as-is home, and the reference home, those are all going to be different homes. Okay. So I want to move on to a few tricks. One of the cool parts about REM is that there's an equation solver in all of the fields. So if I go to the above grade wall, for example, and I'm trying to figure out um, the gross area, and I have um, two walls that are 500 square feet and two walls that are 250, and there are just plus signs between them, and then I tab to the next one, it will actually go ahead and calculate that. So any simple calculate, all numeric inputs, you can go ahead and do as addition, subtraction, whatever you need to do, and it will, um, then give you the value, which is super helpful if you're doing takeoff. Um, you can do it in a different way as well, but something that's kind of easy. The easiest way to go between these if you don't want to use your mouse is to use the tab button. The tab just will scroll through all of that. And the, the Alt key will actually um, bring up file, building, all of those pieces. So actually, if you don't want to use a mouse at all, you wouldn't have to, and then you could hit the letter of whichever thing you were trying to go. So if I want to go to building information, it's B, and it will take me to that screen. So keep in mind if you want to do little shortcuts that that is a really good way to go. One of the other things that might be helpful if you're doing number of buildings or say you have a number of townhomes is to use the set to default building, um, which is under file. So if you go file set to default building, what will happen is that you'll see that it's a, this is the default building. And if I go open a new file, it uses that file as a template. So this is the exact file that we just had used as a template and anytime I hit new, it'll bring. So a really simple example is basically if you just want, um, like the builder information is always the same or your organization information is always the same, you can just save that and leave the rest blank. And then it's really easy to delete the default building. So if you just want to delete it, then next time you go to new, it'll just bring up everything blank. So another little trick. Sorting libraries. So the one thing about libraries is they can get to be a lot of information. So let's just go to the above grade wall library. Um, and say, for example, that you really have a builder that's going to be using SIP or your design is going to be using SIPs. Um, and you, you're going to be using 12-inch SIPs. And so one thing that's kind of annoying you is that you have to scroll all the way down to get to that selection. You can move it up. So if you move up what ends up and hit OK, and then I go to the, um, oh, let me open the file again here. And if I go to the wall, the above grade wall screen, the SIPs is going to be the first under your library selection. So it, it is nice to organize those with the items that you use most. You can delete them as well. Um, you can actually save your own library set if you want it to just be your library set. So keep in mind that you can do all that. The other thing I had done here was you can create faux entries for organizing. So like this is just an empty one that I just put in and named it with some dashes so that as I looked through here, I would be able to kind of quickly categorize things. So you can definitely put those in in between entries to just help you organize. Some of the other customizations that you can do is you can customize reports with graphics. You can add a logo to your um, at either the top of the page or, the, or in the watermark area. So you use options which if you go to tools, options, there's a number of items that you can actually specify here. Um, I actually really had, just for a little diversion, <laughs> I had accidentally set 
a heating size factor of 80% and was having a bunch of trouble with some, some files until I realized that I had needed to set these at 100. So the recommendation is keep these at 100 um, unless you really have a, a reason to change them. You can change the demand and adjust that. Um, again, I would leave it at one unless you need to. Here's the reports where you can, um, you can do additional specifications for some reports. It shows you how you're going to uh, display for some of the Energy Star reports, the Home Energy Rating Certificate. So again, worth looking through all of these um, based on what analysis you want to try to do. The other thing you can do under miscellaneous, as I mentioned, that there was simplified and detailed. You can actually set here detailed as your uh, default mode. So whenever you do a new file, it'll set it to that. Okay, multi-building reports. That's another piece that we should chat through. So we looked at the report selection tool before, and this uh, on the left-hand side shows you the groups of reports to consider. But on the right-hand side, there's a bunch more reporting options that you can do. So the one thing I'm going to really show you right now is the building file report. If I run the building file report for this particular building, it gives me all of the detail of every single thing that I put into that building file. So the general building information, I'm going to just scroll down quickly here. It put all the roof information, we'll scroll quick, mechanical equipment. This matches what I put in as well as then some specifications behind the scenes based on my selection. It's really helpful to kind of understand and go through these if you're having a question or you're, you're not sure what happened or what REM was doing, I would start with the building summary report. The other thing that you can do then is also look at, for example, Energy Star version 3.1 report reports for the building file report. And if I hit OK here, what ends up happening is it'll show me line and reference in building summary format that Remrate uses to do Energy Star version 3.1 design home and then the reference home. So if I click through the report, this is the design and it's going to be all of the information for that design home. And then this is the reference home, which is very useful if you're curious as to how the reference home is configured. So you can do that building file report trick with any of the code compliance homes, IECC 2018. You can do some of uh, the custom codes that we have, so like the National Green Building Standard. You can look at how the design and reference homes are configured for that within the building summary, uh, building file report. Keep in mind that the other thing to notice on these reports is that some of them have a number one by them. That means that it's only a one building report. So if I try to add, let's say, these top four reports, there's two single um, file reports that have ones by them. And if I hit OK, they just won't run because it's only a one building report. So the first thing that will come up is the building summary. If I go back and just put this at the one building report, all of those will run. So that might be one of the reasons that if you're seeing a report and it's not running, what, what might have happened. The last thing I'd like to just show here is, so the one building report is just what I showed. It'll just run the, the as is building that you put in. Any of the hers or, piece, or those beyond will run a design and a reference home for that analysis, which aligns with one of the reports. And then the two building report will actually allow you to set an, a baseline building and compare that to the current file you have. So in that instance, you're basically creating two different building input files and comparing the two. And so, and you can select the base building again if you did something wrong. And then you can basically hit OK. And this will be a building summary. Um, it'll give you this is a good thing to compare, right? So this looks at the component loads. And so you know, you can see that the Energy Star building is the baseline building that we're using here. We're comparing it to this high efficiency building that I put together for the presentation. And if you compare the two, um, you save 56%. Uh, and we're looking at MMBTUs per year. You can see that here. So um, something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so that's two building reports. Um, the economic summary is actually a pretty helpful uh, piece as well. So let's look at a little bit at what that, um, actually let's look at the energy costing feature first because I just wanna, we'll do, we'll do both. There we go, all right. So economic factors for economic summary report, you can calculate using DOE's methodology here. If you wanna use that, that's pretty easy and I, I would actually recommend. Um, so economic summary will, will basically show you from one building to the other um, what your payback might be, and you can actually use this to do improvement analysis. This is often used more frequently on existing homes, but you can also use this to do an ECM type, uh, energy conservation measure type analysis. And then the other report that is actually very useful is the energy cost and features. This is a little bit of a snippet of the building summary report, so it's not quite as long and it's a little less detailed, but it might be a place to start if you have questions. Okay, um, and then I had mentioned the report grouping. The one piece I hadn't mentioned here though was that you can actually create your own groups. So um, you can use a group and you can, you can create a group uh, depending on what you need as far as reports go. It kind of speeds everything up a little bit. You can also do batching. So if for some reason you're doing analysis on a bunch of homes or you're doing an analysis where you just basically wanted to do a parametric type analysis and you changed in one file the insulation and in another you changed, let's say, the wall insulation and then maybe the ceiling insulation and then windows and you kind of strategically did that, you can both modify buildings in, in uh, groups and you can also run reports on them. So let me show you that. So if I go to file and I go to batch file modification, I would just add a bunch of buildings and then I would select, so this is how you modify a bunch of buildings. If I wanted to change this so that all of the windows and skylights were, um, Let's change them to triple, triple, where do we have a good? <laughs> oh, let's do, let's do a double reference clear. It, it actually doesn't really matter for this example. And then you, would, you can put in a folder for your modified files. So um, we would, let's go to REM training and we'll make a new folder that are the uh, batch file. And if I hit OK, and I run this, it will basically then go through and tell me um, each building file that I selected, the version, and that it was saved or not. So there would be a log if it, if it didn't work. For some reason, you could go through that file and look at it. So that'll just really quickly allow you to change um, specific features in, num in a number of files. The other thing that you can actually do as well is if you go to reports and you go to batch, this actually allows you to run a bunch of reports for uh, a number of buildings. So you wouldn't be modifying it in this case, you would be running reports. And if you hit reports and select, you can see that you can just select any of the regular reports. And that's, you'd hit run again and you'd have that. So just ways to use a lot of files at once. You can also export to database. So um, if you go to tools, export, you can export to database if you want to, uh, to basically get your data into a database, that's the way to do it. Um, we already went through the options. So I had gone to um, tools, options, and we, we'd already been through that. So keep in mind all of those. And the other piece then, the other kind of analysis that you can do is also an improvement analysis. So this basically, if you hit on improvement analysis, you um, would have to basically put together measures that you could then run and compare on an individual file. So let's say I wanted to change my window here. You can see that I changed that. I have to add costs though in order to make this work because it does base it on cost. Um, and I'm gonna say that it's 10 cents per square foot. Uh, that's just made up off the top of my head, not real here. Um, and I hit okay. 
and then I run it and this probably isn't going to show a great comparison because they didn't do much but it does show you that that um, that in this case I improved the windows so often used again for existing homes but can also be used for basically an ECM type analysis where you want to look at a bunch of different measures and if you want to do a cost comparison that's really where you want to go okay so I'm going to go back to the presentation because that really concludes my short tour of rim rate. So hopefully that was helpful and that you could kind of go through that. The other piece that I definitely wanted to let you know about is that there's a, um, there's a bunch of training and technical support that you can get at different places. So the technical support, support at rimrate.com is the email. Phone number is here on the slide, 303-459-7504. If you call that, um, you can leave a message. Although the fastest way is usually to, to do it via the email, which goes to our help desk. Um, and basically we have a team here. The, the team that develops Remrate is also the team that does the tech support. So we can answer a variety of questions, both from a coding standpoint, as far as how things are running within the software, but also from a building science standpoint. We also have a Google Groups that has a lot of questions that have already been answered. You do have to go ahead and ask um, uh, permission to go ahead and join but we basically let everybody join and we're just trying to uh, sort out space for the most part so just leave a little note that you're with um, the solar decathlon just let us know and we'll definitely just get you right into the list and you can look at look up any of the questions or kind of see what's happening with REM um, we also do announcements there as far as uh, bug fixes or releases or anything like that are also all available there as well. So I would highly encourage you to join that. And then we do have the REM website, um, remrate.com. And basically that's where you can get, uh, there's, there are some um, additional webinars there. There's, that's where all the contact information is. So if you forget where tech support is, you can't remember, just go to the website, you'll see all of that information there. The other two that I wanted to include here are just some resources for you. So ResNet does have a variety of standards that have been developed that are the basis for some of these analyses. So the ERI, which is used in code and is also used by ResNet in the form of the HERS index, those specifications are available. Um, basically ResNet, uh, ResNet's website here, and the standards name is ANSI ResNet 301. If you look that up, you can also just get to it pretty easily. And I would rec also recommend the Building America Solution Center, which I'm sure you're familiar with probably, but uh, very helpful for building science. So I use that often. And really congratulations and uh, best of luck to all the teams. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>